Hello, this is Jim Horman with Horman Soil Health Services. Today we're going to do a presentation on getting started with cover crops. Here's just a quick overview. This is what we'll be talking about. We're going to discuss some of the summer or warm season cover crops. These are cover crops that you would generally put out after wheat. We'll also discuss the winter or cold season cover crops. These would be cover crops that generally can survive the winter. We would put those out after corn and soybeans. Then we'll get into different classes of cover crops like the brassicas, which include the radish, the kale, and the rape. We'll discuss some of the grass species like oats, cereal rye, sorghum sedan, uh, annual ryegrass. And then uh, we'll also give a brief overview of some of the legumes and clover, such as Valencia and crimson clover, hairy vetch, winter peas, sun hemp, red clover, and sweet clover. And then uh, we got just a few slides on cover crop mixes. Here's just a nice picture of a mixture of cover crops that were put out. We like to see healthy growth and whatever you see above ground is generally what's also going on below ground. We have a lot of diversity in some of our warm season grasses and broadleaves. Cow peas, sun hemp, buckwheat, and sunflower are just a couple of the different broadleaves. Anything with an L is a legume, which means that they make their own nitrogen. Even soybeans and alfalfa can be used as cover crops, but we generally like to stay away from them because we want a little bit more diversity. Also in some areas, safflower is uh, also used. Under the warm season grasses, the biggest one is the sorghum and the sorghum sedan species. We also have pearl millet, which has a, a huge head on it. It's a very pretty flower on it. But uh, corn, prozo millet, milo, teff are some of the grasses that, that can be planted short term. When we look at the diversity on the cool season grasses, we're looking at things like oats and uh, cereal rye are probably the two most popular. Triticale is a combination of rye and uh, wheat. Wheat can be used as a cover crop, but we generally try to stay away from it just so we get a little bit more diversity. A lot of wheat diseases are similar to corn, so you want to be a little careful about putting wheat and corn together. Also, some folks will grow annual ryegrass. It's a little more difficult to manage, but it, it does have a tremendous root system and it, it is a pretty good uh, cover crop. When we look at the cool season broadleaves, some of the mustards or what we'd really call like the brassicas or the, the radish, the daikon radish, the kale, uh, turnip has been used for grazing, and then canola or really what we call rapeseed. Uh, rapeseed is just a wild cousin to the canola. And then under the legumes have uh, winter peas, and field peas, we'll discuss the difference between those two. Uh, hairy vetch is, is very common. And then uh, we have Valencia, crimson uh, clover, and red clover are, are all common uh, uh, legumes that are cool season broadleaves. This just shows a picture of what we want to see, some diversity above and below the ground. We want to feed that soil biology, feed them a, a balanced diet. The microbes end up feeding your uh, your grain crops and also your, your grain and soybeans. And so you got to have a really healthy microbial community, and you do that by having a diversity of cover crops out there. This just shows diversity in a cropping system. Just some examples here. we got some cool season grasses in the upper left-hand corner. Some cool season broadleaves there. Bottom is warm season grasses and uh, warm season broadleaves. So a lot of different combinations. We're going to now talk about some of the different types of cover crops. We have legumes that make their nitrogen, make their own nitrogen. They're, they have a low C to N ratio, which means they have low carbon, high nitrogen. They generally have tap roots. And some examples would be cow peas, the Austrian pea, the hairy vetch, the red and sweet clover, sun hemp, lupins, and also soybeans. 
all the legumes need to be inoculated to uh, maximize their production of nitrogen. They are just a little bit more expensive, but when you take into account the amount of nitrogen you can get out of them, they're actually quite economical. When we're looking at their grasses, we're looking at a lot of fine roots. The C to N ratio is going to uh, vary depending on the killing date. Uh, the more lignified it is, the higher the C to N ratio. But oats, wheat, cereal rye, annual rye grass, barley, and sorghum sedan and then some of the millets. The brassicas are really good for surface compaction and weed control. The biggest one that's planted is the daikon or the white radish, uh, turnips for grazing, and then kale and rape. Let's look at the brassicas first. Rad radishes are very fast growing. They're high in moisture. They, they tend to freeze out and die at around 15 degrees Fahrenheit. They have probably the highest nitrogen availability uh, because they really absorb nitrogen out of the soil. Generally, it's going to be around 5 to 5.3 percent nitrogen. The problem with it is it, it's not very stable. Since they die, uh, they're going to leach a lot of those nutrients, including any nitrogen or phosphorus, into the soil. They do have a natural uh, fumigant and a natural weed suppressant chemical that they release when they decompose. Another problem with the radish, though, is they really do smell bad uh, when they decompose. Some people say it smells like propane, a gas leak. I tend to think it smells more like a dirty diaper. They really do stink for a couple days, but usually it will go away. Anytime the temperature gets above 50 degrees, you're going to be able to smell the radish for a couple days. Here's David Brandt. This is an older picture. You don't need to get your radishes quite that big. What you're looking at there is only about half of the root. The very fine hairs on the on the roots make up the other half of that uh, radish. Generally, if we get a, an inch to two inch radish, that's plenty big. They'll go down two to three feet deep, uh, even three to five under good growing conditions. Biggest problem you have is you don't want to plant them too early because they can go to seed. But they are very good at breaking up compaction and to uh, controlling weeds. Just some of the advantages, disadvantages of cover crop radishes. We'll start with the disadvantages. You don't, again, you don't want to sow them too early because they will reseed. And you also don't want to sow them too late. They need at least six to seven weeks of growth for best results. Sometimes hard seed can come up in the spring and then it may compete with your other crops. And again, the bad part is they do smell uh, when they decompose. Uh, the advantages are much better than the disadvantages. Potentially, they have a very deep penetrating large tuber uh, that really improves uh, soil structure. Uh, it enhances soil percolation of water. It's going to reduce your soil compaction. Earthworms just absolutely love the, the uh, radishes, and they do take up a lot of nutrients, although they, they're not always that great at hanging on to them. That's why, generally, we only recommend planting two pounds of radish in a mixture because we don't want to have problems with water quality. We have seen issues in northwest Ohio where it was all 100% radish, and when the radish died, there was a tremendous leaching of nitrogen and phosphorus into the near, near, nearby streams. And they're also good for grazing. This just shows some of the daikon radish. And you'll notice with this uh, penetrometer there that they'll reduce compaction quite a bit. That root uh, takes up a lot of space, and it creates a lot of pore space to let water in and also to break up the compaction. On David Brandt's farm, uh, they, they collected some data and they found out that the compaction decreased by greater than uh, 40% wherever they had the radish compared to an open field. So the radish are very good for both weed control and uh, soil compaction. They also uh, take up a lot of nutrients. So what this graph shows is that they reduce the amount of nitrogen uh, in the soil by, by about 75 to 80 uh, percent. So uh, the yellow bars there show how much of a decrease there is. The brown bars are the soil without uh, oilseed radish, and the uh, orange are the ones where the, where the radish are. So the difference between those two is about an 80 percent reduction. The radish are really good at absorbing a lot of uh, nitrate from, from your soil. 
just another test that was done at Ohio State. They have an average of 24 tests, seven field sites. And again, wherever you have the oil seed radish, the concentration of nitrates in the soil is considerably less compared to where you have no cover. Again, they're, they're absorbing that nitrogen. Unfortunately, a lot of that nitrogen and phosphorus also is, could be released uh, when they decompose. Well, here's some radish and winter peas pictures. This just shows you what they look like in the spring. We see some of the radish carcasses there uh, just laying on top of the ground. And you'll also see uh, winter peas. Uh, this is a nice combination because the uh, uh, radishes open the soil up, aerate it, uh, allow it to warm up a little bit more, whereas the winter peas are going to give us some nitrogen. So a lot of farmers plant these two together and then plant corn into that. Some farmers are a little worried that if those holes get too big, we have found that that's really not the case. They just mellow the ground out so much that if you plant either right over the top or right beside of it, it seems like that's a, a really good environment for corn, even the soybeans to grow. A couple other ones that we have are kale and rape. Generally, we're going to plant these at somewhere uh, between three to five pounds, no more than eight pounds. They're often used in mixtures at uh, even like a quarter to half pound. The seed is extremely small. The, the rape seed or the variety we use is dwarf exix and has a very fibrous root system. It's 15 to 25% crude protein. It's, it's a very good forage. Needs to be planted just a little bit earlier than the kale, usually uh, mid-October. The kale can be planted a little bit later in October, but usually any of these, we, the earlier we plant them, the better. They're very cold tolerant. They can reach 25 inches tall. They can be grazed until December or January and they are really good for wildlife. So here's a couple pictures coming up. This is what the kale looks like. This was a very dense stand of kale. Generally, we don't wanna see them quite that big. They get really big leaves that are about four inches wide. Um, most of these plants will survive the winter. Uh, and then we've also had this dwarf exix rape. And again, it's a very big, very leafy plant, has a nice yellow flower in the spring. It's a great pollinator. It can be a little bit difficult to uh, kill. You don't want to kill it with Roundup. It's going to take something like 2,4-D. They are uh, uh, great for breaking up uh, and adding some diversity, breaking up the soil and adding some diversity. Now, let's talk about some of the grasses. What do the grasses do for us? They provide most of the carbon. They also accumulate a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus. So we really like to use grasses if we're going to put on manure. Uh, they're very good at providing uh, phosphorus to the other legumes, while legumes uh, supply nitrogen to our crops. So grasses release phosphorus and make it plant available. They also, uh, with those fibrous roots, uh, uh, have are really good at reducing horizontal uh, soil compaction. The fibrous roots also protect the soil, keep it from eroding, and they're a great habitat for uh, microbial communities. And so they're very good at promoting good soil structure. Here's an example of one of our favorites is oats. Uh, we have a lot of different varieties of oats now. We have the, the typical is the spring oats, but we also have now winter oats, black oats, and uh, forage oats. So forage oats just have a little bit bigger leaf on it. They are very good at pr uh, helping protect the soil from erosion. They're very good at scavenging for nitrogen and they're highly mycorrhizal oats are. So oats really enhance our microbial diversity. Most of our soils are dominated by bacteria and, and oats is probably, that's one of the reasons they call it a nurse crop. It's also very good at helping with disease suppression. It's one of the few species that will counteract what Roundup does. Roundup will tie up or bind, chelate a lot of micronutrients, whereas oats will make manganese more available and it helps against fusarium. So it's really quick to establish. It's relatively inexpensive. You can broadcast them or they can be lightly tilled in or drilled. Drilled is always better. And you can even use them for forage. So oats are better cover crops. It should be in just about every mixture. Generally, we're doing it just by themselves. We'll uh, drill them in at about 40 to 42 pounds per acre. You can go down a half inch to an inch and a half. 
Uh, if you're going to broadcast them, uh, you want to up that by about 10% just so that you can get a, a good stand. Here's just an example of some oats that were planted on uh, August 3rd, and this photo was taken on August 10th. You might look at that and think, well, that's really a good stand to oats, but there's a couple problems here. We've done some research on the oats, and when the oats is very small and they die off, generally oats are going to die off in probably in the teens, similar to the radish. If they're very small and have a low carbon to nitrogen ratio, you can get about a 5 to 10 bushel yield increase the next year on corn. When the oats are in the boot stage, they're excellent for forage. Uh, the cattle and sheep just love oats hay. You can harvest it. Uh, you'll still have all that biomass below ground. And generally, if, if, you, if you don't harvest it, you'll, you won't see much of a yield increase or decrease. But if the oats are in this stage and you let them go till next year, they're, they're becoming highly lignified. It's not uncommon to see about a 5 to 10 bushel yield decrease. So if you have oats that are starting to mature, you have two options. One, either mow them down or harvest them for hay. Uh, so that you don't have a problem with corn uh, next year if you're planting corn into that. Some of the advantages, disadvantages, uh, we'll start with the advantages this time. They scavenge nitrogen. They are very deep and have a very fibrous root mass. Uh, they work well with aerial application. They're excellent for forage. Most of the time, they're going to win or kill. Probably another advantage we're not talked about too often is because of that fibrous root system, they're really good at breaking up soil compaction. Disadvantages, the bin run oats may have some weed seed in them, so you might want to make sure you get them killed. Again, it could be an advantage or disadvantage. They do winter kill, but there are some like the uh, winter oats that will go down to about the single digits before they die out. So in some years, the oats won't winter kill. If you're, if you're using a, a, a winter type of oat. High boy applications can be used with uh, the oats. This was oats that was applied with a high boy on, uh, in July. It's been a few years ago. Uh, this was a drought year, but you can see uh, they get just a little bit of moisture. Most of the time, if you're going to broadcast cover crops, you need at least an inch, maybe two inches of rain in order to get them. But when uh, this corn was harvested, the oats were, were growing. Once that corn starts to dry down and the leaves start to bend, bend down, you get some light in between the rows and uh, cover crops can grow. Here's some winter rye. This is one of our favorites. Advantages of winter rye is it can be planted later than any other cover crop. It will germinate at 32 degrees. It will even grow underneath the snow. You can aerial apply it or drill it. Drilling it is always better. I like to see it drilled just so that we don't get issues with uh, voles and slugs because they like to consume cereal rye. It has a really good deep rooting depth. It'll go down 30 inches, but not much more than that. So they'll uh, go down to about where our tile is, which is about 30 inches. Uh, they have excellent winter hardiness, uh, probably the best of any cover crop we have. They're excellent scavengers of nitrogen and phosphorus. And a lot of vegetable farmers will use them and they'll roll them down with a roller crimper. So they can be used in corn. We can use them in corn and soybeans. Soybeans is where we, we see them most of the time. If you're going to use them in corn, you got to be a little careful because it might take a little extra nitrogen. But tomatoes, watermelons, muskmelons, any of your vine plants uh, seem to work well with cereal rye. Potatoes is another example. Any of the beans and the peas. Disadvantages, it can have an aliopathic effect, especially on corn. Uh, you got to be a little bit careful. There's about 67 different varieties of winter rye. A couple varieties are are uh, non-aliopathic. They're hard to find, but if you can find those varieties, that's what you'd want to plant if you're going to go to corn. And sometimes it can get away from you in the spring. It grows really fast in the spring. All winter long, it's taking in nutrients, and when spring comes, it can get six, seven, even eight feet tall. If you plant right into that, you can plant green, and then you can just roll it down, and it makes an excellent barrier to weeds. So a lot of organic farmers use uh, winter rye at a very high rate, sometimes two to three bushels. Most of the time, we're going to put it on probably at a bushel, even less, just to give some cover to the soil. Advantages, again, it's excellent for winter or spring grazing. Uh, you can get four to six tons of hay leach off of it. 
uh, may have somewhat of an aliopathic effect. Uh, that's good if you want to keep out the weeds. Uh, if you're going to plant corn, you have to be careful. Generally, though, if you harvest it, a lot of dairy producers will put out silage, and after they take the silage off, they'll plant the cereal rye at a fairly high rate, put on some manure, and then they can harvest that. And most of the aliopathic effect is in the leaves and in the stem. And then they can plant their corn right into that without any yield loss. It does make an, an excellent system for uh, dairy producers. And it's also excellent before soybeans. We're seeing anywhere from a five to seven bushel increase. We plant our soybeans into it, let the beans come up. We can roll that. And uh, once we kill that cereal rye and it goes flat, what it does is it protects those beans and keeps the moisture uh, going into the summer. So we have a weed-free environment with warm, but it's not too hot either So because we don't have that bare ground. Annual ryegrass is another one. Probably the biggest disadvantage to annual ryegrass is it can be difficult to kill. It's a little harder to manage. A lot of these varieties won't live through the winter. If you want to find a variety that does live through the winter, you want one with a waxy leaf so that it can survive the winds. Advantages, we've got some newer, harder varieties. Uh, King is a really good variety. It's deep, has a very fibrous root mass, about 50% more roots than what uh, cereal rye. The problem with annual ryegrass is it doesn't go dormant. And since it doesn't go dormant, it just keeps growing and the roots get really, really deep. And uh, it's about like a thistle. It's a little hard to kill in the spring. So you got to be careful. Generally, if you want to kill it, you want to kill it before it starts to joint or after it's already started, it's in the boot stage and it's starting to bloom. Those are the two times that are the easiest to kill it. Um, it's excellent for forage, although you will never dry it down. So it, it will be a wet bale if you're going to bale it. Usually we, we like to plant it in early August through early September. Anywhere from 18 pounds if you're going to drill it to 22 pounds if you're going to aerial seed it. You put it in about a quarter to a half inch deep. Winter barley is one that's starting to become more popular. You can harvest the winter barley and feed it just like you do corn, one-to-one -one with corn. Most of the time, though, if we're going to use it as a cover crop, it makes, like I said, excellent feed or haylage. Generally comes off about two weeks earlier if you are going to harvest it than wheat. It kind of depends on the planting date. So it takes less nitrogen. It doesn't need quite as much fertility. It is an excellent scavenger of nitrogen. It's uh, more tolerant, I guess, of low fertility type situations. It's also just a little bit less winter hardy. Generally, we would probably seed this at about 59, 60 pounds per acre drilled and put it in about uh, three quarters to uh, inch and a half deep. Winter barley is becoming more popular. Pearl millet, this is a summer annual now. We're going to plant this after wheat, about 12 pounds to the acre. That's the picture on the left-hand side. You're going to drill that about a half inch to uh, one inch deep. And one of my favorites is a sorghum sedan or any of the sorghum species. It takes about 23 pounds per acre drilled, uh, and you're going to put that in about a half inch to an inch and a half deep. One of the good things about sorghum sedan is if you let it uh, get up about maybe two and a half, three feet tall, if you mow that high, what will happen is it'll tiller, and you'll get five to ten times more roots. It's one of the best ways to add carbon and sugar into the soil. The microbes and the cattle and the sheep just love sorghum sedan because it's quite sweet, and it's also very good for diversity. Very good at breaking up soil compaction, and because it's so dense and tall, it's also good at shading out weeds. So it has a lot of advantages to putting sorghum sedan. I've had a couple farmers on paulding clay soils they were really disappointed with their soybean yields. We're only getting 30, 35 bushel. Uh, when they put out sorghum sedan and did what I said, cut it off, let it regrow. And if it gets up tall, you can harvest it. There's nothing wrong with harvesting it. You can feed it to your cattle and let it grow out again. 
he did that, and instead of getting 30 to 35 bushel the next year, he was up to 50 bushel soybeans. He wasn't planting corn because he was only getting 80 bushel corn. Uh, now he's regularly getting 140 to 150 bushel corn by putting sorghum sedan in the rotation. So in a corn, soybean, wheat rotation, you can put the sorghum sedan out after the, the wheat uh, comes off, and that was helping uh, his other yields. We also like to see buckwheat and sunflowers. Uh, these are great pollinators, so the buckwheat's at the bottom there, the bottom right-hand corner, and the sunflowers at the top right-hand corner. Buckwheat, we generally would put in at about 24 pounds per acre, drill those at a half to one and a half inch deep. There's one thing about buckwheat you want to be a little careful. You don't want to go out into a buckwheat field after 4 p.m., at 4 p.m., the flowers start to close, and they are, they're such great pollinators, the bees get a little ticked off out there. So if you're out there, good chance you're going to get buzzed, okay? Sunflowers, great pollinators, a lot of beneficial uh, insects, really love the sunflowers. You can put them in at about 12 pounds per acre if it's drilled, uh, about a one and a half to two and a half inches deep. And in a lot of cases, uh, guys will do a mixture of, of sunflowers with, with some other things. And uh, sunflowers are just a nice pollinator, very beautiful. And if you want to pick up some extra land, put out some uh, sunflowers, put out some buckwheat. Uh, the landladies really like to see some of these flowers. Now, let's talk a little bit about some legumes and clovers. So again, the legumes and clovers, they make nitrogen with the help of uh, rhizobia bacteria. They're going to help provide nitrogen to your grasses. Generally, a little bit longer, deeper taproot. Uh, help us with the vertical compaction. They're very good at recycling uh, phosphorus and potassium, but uh, one of the downsides is acidify the soil, and they don't have nearly as much root mass. So we don't hang on to the carbon in the legumes and the clovers. They just decompose so quickly, but we do like them for the amount of nitrogen that they can produce. Valencia clover is becoming one of my favorite. Favorites. This is a high biomass uh, clover. It's used a lot in the northeast, especially on the dairy farms. You can get up to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre off of Balencia clover. It makes a good forage, uh, three to five tons. A lot of times they'll put out Balencia, they'll harvest it for hay, and then plant corn silage. It's 22 to 28% crude protein. It has a relative feed value of like 277. So very, very good feed. It's also more winter hardy. It's got a hollow stem, so it tolerates flooding, and it's not a soybean cyst nematode host. So it can grow... Uh, anywhere from 3 to 14 feet. It's very viney, but it's relatively easy to kill. has an, a good deep tap root and a yellow flower. Uh, you can kill it by just rolling it or, or spraying it with a herbicide. Uh, the broadcast seed rate, it's such a small seed. It's somewhere around 8 pounds if you're going to do it for hay. Generally, uh, most times uh, if we're doing it for a cover crop, we'll just drill it at about 5 pounds per acre. Uh, at broadcast seeding, it, you know, it's such a small seed, it doesn't have to go in very deep, less than a quarter of an inch. So, and all it takes is a little bit of rain to bring it up. But uh, it, it is a great uh, newer cover crop that, that we're starting to see more of. Crimson clover, Valencia is starting to replace the crimson clover because it's a little more reliable than the crimson clover. The biggest disadvantage is with crimson clover is sometimes it will win or kill. Uh, and it can also be a little bit difficult to kill in the spring. So you need to let crimson clover grow till at least uh, May 1st if you want to maximize your nitrogen. Generally, when uh, legumes start to bloom, that's when you get your maximum nitrogen. So when you're at a 10% bloom, you really, if you're not going to keep them for hay production, you might as well just terminate them and uh, plant your crops. Plant your crops into them first. I really like to see the green planting and then terminate them uh, shortly after that. The advantages, it can produce up to 140 pounds of nitrogen within 90 days following wheat. The earthworms love them. Also, I might add, uh, there's been some reports that uh, voles do not like the crimson clover, so it might be able to help you with a vole issue. There are some excellent new early and uh, more winter hardy varieties out there that, that are available. Uh, so uh, we are seeing a lot of folks are putting crimson clover in, but you got to remember to inoculate. It takes a very special inoculant uh, to, to use that. Hairy vetch is very popular on well-drained soils. 
usually on hills. A lot of biomass, you can get up to 200 pounds of nitrogen. Most of that nitrogen is all in the leaf and in the stems. And so uh, you can plant corn right into that, plant it green, and then uh, that'll kill about half of it. And then you can crimp or roll it. That'll take it down without having to use herbicides. It's really good for soil compactions, but again, they do need well-drained soils. It can grow three to seven feet. It has a vine uh, taproot and, and this really pretty purple flower. Broadcast seed rate is somewhere around 18 to 22 pounds per acre. If you're going to drill it, you can get by with 15 to 20. You only have to put it in about a half to an inch and a half deep. The one real big disadvantage to hairy vetch, especially if you plant it after wheat, is uh, it can have hard seed, especially if you get it into wheat. Uh, it will kind of wrap like morning glory, but you can take that out with 2,4-D early in the spring. So uh, hairy vetch has been uh, a very popular and used on a lot of farms, especially organic farms for a number of years. One that I've done a little research on is uh, sweet clover. Uh, it has a tremendous biomass. It is a biannual. That means it's a two-year crop. Generally, we would frost seed this into wheat in March or early April when the ground's frozen. Let it grow with the wheat, and then by next year, it will grow up. It has a really pretty blossom on it. It looks a lot like alfalfa, and it is an excellent pollinator. So if you are going to pollinate it or use it for bees, the bees just go nuts on it. So some of the best honey around. can be used as a forage. It is shade tolerant, so you can uh, seed it in with wheat or even into another crop. The broadcast seeding rates around 7 to 12 pounds per acre. Usually it's best to frost seed it or you can drill it at 6 to 10 pounds per acre. About a quarter inch deep. Don't want to get it too deep because it just won't come up. It does grow two to four feet tall and it is an excellent soil builder. One of the disadvantages it is a hard seed and in some states it may be considered a noxious weed so uh, you might want to be a little bit careful of that but it is an excellent pollinator we see it a lot of times along the roadways especially new roads it's one of those called a soil builder uh, because it tends to rejuvenate the soil austrian winter peas and canadian field peas what's the difference well the austrian field winter pea generally are planted first around august and they will get to be a, a foot and a half, two, three, four feet tall. I know I've seen on Dave Brandt's farm, he had some uh, get five feet tall. Puts on a lot of nodules. You can get 150 pounds of nitrogen out of your Austrian winter pea. Once they get that big in the fall, though, they're going to die. So they're not going to survive the winter. The Canadian or field pea or the true winter pea, Generally, we're going to plant that at a later date, after your beans or corn. Generally, after beans, because then you're going to go to corn. And it will only get up maybe a couple inches, two, three inches tall. You want to let that grow and survive through the winter. And then it'll regrow in the spring. And you don't want to kill the true winter pea until it starts to bloom. And it can put on about 75 pounds of total nitrogen. So the Austrian winter pea, since we're planting it after wheat around the 1st of August, has a much bigger, longer time to grow and it'll give us more nitrogen, Whereas, uh, but it won't survive the winter. Whereas the Canadian field pea, we're going to plant later and it gives us about half as much nitrogen. Both of them, though, are, are excellent in front of corn. Just a little bit more about the Austrian winter pea uh, disadvantages. It's best to be if it's incorporated. Generally, almost always winter kills. Uh, it needs at least five to six weeks for uh, best results. And if you want to graze it or try to harvest it, you can only expect to get one uh, grazing or harvest on. The advantage is, though, it, it can produce 60 to 150 pounds of nitrogen. It's easy to kill because it's going to die in the winter, and it don't take many, many herbicides. Here's Dave Brandt with some of his winter peas. Uh, he was the Ohio no-till president. He's known for putting out a lot of, lot of winter peas. Legume hemp uh, is also another good cover crop, okay? But it's a little expensive. Uh, crotillaria is what they call it. This is a, a cover crop that's used a lot in South America. This is their sole source of nitrogen. They'll grow legume hemp with uh, sun hemp with their corn. It'll supply all the nitrogen for the corn, and they actually harvest uh, two crops. The sun hemp will grow above the corn. They'll harvest the sun hemp first. 
then they'll come back and harvest the, the corn at a later date. Generally, if you're going to plant sun hemp by itself, it would be 12 pounds to the acre. Put it in about a half to one and a half inches deep. Uh, usually you would do this in July after wheat. Some are trying to interseed it. Uh, it's a little bit tricky and uh, it takes a lot of moisture. So if you have a dry year, you probably don't want to plant the sun hemp. The seed is a little expensive. Uh, you probably want to get variety that's made in the United States that comes out of Georgia. I think that might be Sunshine. I forget exactly, but uh, there is one out of Georgia that uh, is adapted a little bit to our weather in, in the United States. It does get a huge, huge nodule. These are as big as your thumb. The biggest problem is that don't ever try to harvest it for seed because it takes a long time, almost 180 days, uh, but you can get up to 200 pounds of nitrogen out of this if you get a really, really good stand. Most of the time, it doesn't grow that well in Ohio. We just haven't seen uh, that kind of production. But uh, it does add some diversity, and uh, it can be grazed. This is a typical uh, no-till crop rotation where we, we might be able to uh, reduce some of our fertilizer and also get some of the benefits from the cover crop. So generally, after wheat... We could put in something like cow peas or, or really a multi-species mix. Then we would go to corn and uh, we get the benefit of the nitrogen. After the corn, we're going to plant cereal rye. After cereal rye, we would go to soybeans. And following the soybeans, we go back to wheat. So that's a three-crop rotation with two cover crops in it. And uh, that's a popular uh, rotation that will minimize your nitrogen uh, input. Cow peas are, are one of those that, again, we can get 130 to 150 pounds of nitrogen out. There was some research done at Ohio State on this. Almost all the nitrogen is up in the shoot and in the leaves. This is a picture of where we had some corn. You can see that corn in the background ground is dark green. It had no nitrogen added. All that nitrogen came from the cow peas. So these plots are rotated uh, in a, uh, this one was wheat and then it uh, planted cow peas and then it went to corn. So uh, it does show that we can use the cover crops to supply a lot of our nitrogen needs for corn. This is some corn from Bill Richards farm. Corn no-tilled into the Austrian winter peas. The nice thing about this is the Austrian winter peas uh, acted like a trap crop. He had a tremendous slug problem. The slugs went after the winter peas because that's a nice legume. By the time they got done consuming the winter peas, the corn had outgrown the slugs. The corn was able to take advantage of all the, the slug poop that was on the ground. So in this case, the slugs really didn't cause a problem. You probably don't want to promote having slugs out there, but at least in this situation, really reduce their slug issue by planting winter peas. Also, when you plant legumes, uh, you want to make sure that you uh, uh, have a good crop rotation. You got to be careful of the time of planting. You don't want to plant them too late. They do require inoculation. It's always better to drill the legumes rather than broadcast them because you'll get better stands. Just a couple quick slides on inoculation. We're finding out that uh, not all inoculations are the same. The cover crop legumes need rhizobia of a very specific type. And if you don't put them on at the right time, you'll, you'll have an issue. So a lot of times we pre-inoculate with these, but we're finding out that the cover crop legumes seed uh, inoculant uh, just doesn't last very long. Usually only anywhere from 12 to 48 hours. So it's best to inoculate them at planting. You want to get the best results. So pre-inoculated seed, you might want to just be a little bit aware that survivability may not be that great, especially depending on how it's stored. If it was stored, if it's warm temperatures or exposed to sunlight, you're going to get uh, hurt by that. So this just shows you that on soybeans, that inoculant can last quite a long time. On alfalfa and red clover, up to two years. But when we get into like crimson clover and some of the peat-based planter box products, we're only looking at a maximum 48 hours. Hairy batch and winter peas, 12 to 24 hours. So you want to be aware that that inoculant doesn't last very long. So make sure when you're inoculating cover crops that you do if you want to maximize your nitrogen, if you're not getting nodules, it's because you didn't have enough inoculant out there. I generally like to put on uh, two to three times what they state. 
we have found that we just get better results. And then once you get that inoculum established, you can cut back. But at least the first year or two, uh, you need to be aware of that. And it really does matter what, what the conditions are. Again, just to emphasize, each legume species requires a certain strain in order to, to not nodulate uh, properly. So you got to have the right strain. You can't use corn, soybean, inoculant on some of the legumes like crimson clover, winter peas, uh, hairy vetch. You got to have a specific inoculant for each of those. This is a common strategy that we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, cover crop dealers. They'll use this linked inoculant. It's easy to apply. You know, they say it's effective. I have my doubts a little bit on that. Uh, it's economical. Don't cost much. Um, and it's multidimensional. The problem is uh, there's not, you know, you would rather put on more inoculant on for each seed. And when you pre-inoculate, Again, uh, they're not going to last very long. It's it's probably best if you're going to use this in a multi-species. If you got a lot of different legumes in there, you want to put this on right at the time of planting. Then you may get by with it. But I prefer to see each plant have its own inoculant being added uh, and uh, uh, make sure that you get the right amount uh, and, and put plenty on. Uh, so uh, it does cause some issues. When we're looking at C to N ratios for various crops, uh, you know, you can see that uh, the rye is kind of like the tortoise, has a very high to carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's going to tie up nitrogen uh, compounds when we get starting getting C to N ratios above 20 to 1. So, you know, uh, rye straw can be up there to 80 uh, or more. Uh, wheat straw is all up there. It's going to tie up a lot of nitrogen and that's going to take it away from your corn. So usually it's best to put a legume following rye. So soybeans does quite well with rye because it can get some of the phosphorus from the rye. And rye also will reduce some of the rhizectonia and phytophthora and also with soybean cyst nematode. If you're going to plant corn, you probably want to plant a legume like hairy vetch. You want to have a lower then 20 to 1 C to N ratio, 24 to 1 at a minimum. Uh, those low to C to N ratios makes more nitrogen available. And so corn then can do quite well. So if you're trying to plant, you know, kind of a mixture of rye and hairy vetch, now you've got kind of a balanced C to N ratio uh, will help to control how fast it decomposes. And that's why we like to see some of the mixes. We get a, a lot of different uh, C to N ratios, and that's a slow release of nitrogen throughout that growing season. What fits after corn and soybeans? Well, we don't have a real full toolbox when we do that. We're somewhat limited by the planting date. It really helps if you can plant some earlier maturing corn and soybean varieties. It really doesn't hurt your yield that much. We're finding out that yield in corn and soybeans is determined by moisture at pollination more than it is uh, the length of the growing season. So drilling does provide some better stands if you can drill it rather than broadcasting it. And you, bet you need to have about a 30 to 60 day uh, window at least in order to get some of the benefits out of that cover crop. Uh, what species work best after corn and soybeans? Generally cereal, rye, oats. You can plant annual rye grass in September. Oats generally mid to late September, first of September, anywhere really from the first of August through uh, about first part of October on oats. Annual rye grass needs to be planted in uh, mid September. Crimson clover also works best in September. And then uh, some of the brassicas, uh, you could probably go up to the first part of October on that. But And then mixes of all those uh, work out. And we have a lot of these cover crops now being put on with high boys or aerial seeding. You just have to up the seeding rate and hope you get at least a good rain. It's always best to drill them if, if at all possible. What fits after wheat? Well, the, the toolbox is wide open. You can plant just about anything. You can do it for forage. You can do it for sequestering nutrients, especially if you have manure, uh, for nitrogen production, or just for building soil organic matter, especially if you want to put some sorghum species out there or some of the grasses. Uh, the caution is do not plant any of these cover crops. You want to be careful you don't plant them too early. Usually early August is, is the best time. Because if you plant them too early, some of them can go to seed and then they can become a weed. Three-way mixes. This is a very popular one. Oats, 
radish and crimson clover, or you might substitute for crimson clover, the Balencia. The nice thing about this three-way mix is two of them are going to die out, the oats and the radish, then you only have to manage one. If you decide to substitute a cereal rye for the oats, now you've got a problem in the spring because you got to determine, well, do I kill the cereal rye early or, or do I let it go and, and let the crimson clover grow so that I can get maximum nitrogen production? So this is a really nice three-way mix because the oats is going to add carbon. It's going to improve our water infiltration, uh, help us with soil compaction, and it's highly mycorrhizal. The radish is really good for accumulating nutrients. But again, it's going to die out. When it dies out, the crimson clover will take up any of those nutrients. And it's also good for uh, fumigating the soil, helping to get rid of weeds. And then the crimson clover is going to add some nitrogen and it's some permanent cover in, in the wintertime so we don't have soil erosion. So that's a nice three-way mix. So here's an example of that three-way mix, uh, radish, oats, crimson clover. Uh, it's very easy to manage. Uh, like I say, they grow fast. They're shade tolerant. So a lot of farmers like this mix. Uh, you can kill it one week before the crimson clover to five days after planting. I like to see farmers plant green into it and then kill it. It seems like we get the best results. We don't get as much wrapping of the material uh, on the planter. So it's a lot easier to do that. We can also do 10-way mixes just to give you an example. So here's a 10-way mix. We're using some summer annuals. That's SA, some buckwheat and sunflowers as pollinators. We're using another summer annual, uh, cowpeas. Radishes generally die out, uh, great for nutrient uptake and for uh, taking and compaction and getting rid of weeds. Then we got the sorghum sedan varieties that will help to add carbon, uh, improve our soil structure. You can add some oats. They're a great nurse crop. They help with disease uh, suppression. Cereal rye uh, will survive the winter. Uh, the kale is a, another winter annual and uh, so is crimson clover and red clover. So uh, several varieties in there that will help you with nitrogen and it, this is a good mixture going to corn. Now one of the things that we uh, often ask is, how do I know how much of each to put in? And so let's use our three-way mix because that's an easy example. So you just take the full rate, and if you have three species, you divide it by three. And that's a good ballpark for, for what you might want to plan if you're going to do like a three-way mix. In a 10-way mix like this, you take whatever the full rate is and you divide it by 10. And that'll give you a, a rough estimate. Now, you can play with that a little bit. If you want a few more legumes in there or you want more carbon or something, you can add uh, a, a little bit of more of one. So it, it's not an exact science, but it does really help. So this is an example of a 10-way mix. Uh, many different cover crop mixtures and combinations grown to help us with a lot of different resource concerns that we ha might uh, have out there. It's going to improve our diversity, and it's going to increase our resiliency so we have better, better crops out there. So in summary, plant a diversity of cover crops, including both warm season plants, that those are going to die off, and then you want to mix in some cold season uh, plants. The brassicas include mainly the uh, daikon radish, the kale, and the rape. On grasses, we're looking at oats, cereal rye, sorghum sedan. We've also got some millets and uh, the annual ryegrass. For legumes, we're looking at winter peas, Crimson clover, the Balencia, the red clover, sweet clover, sun hemp, and hairy betch. And then if you are going to use legumes, you want to make sure that you use the right inoculant so that you get those legumes off to a good start. So with that, that's the end of getting started with cover crops. If you have questions, give me a call at my telephone number, or you can contact me uh, by email. Uh, I also have a website with many, many different resources on there. So this is Jim Horman with Horman Soil Health Services. Have a good day.